that many times even us in the black church we feel that you know sometimes for our uh, out of our own self-hatred we will feel that we need to imitate uh systems of church that have come out of the white circles and we just have to you know just do a black version of a white thing but this you know african bible canon even if you don't want to accept it which i think it's honestly personally fine either way um uh, or convert to that i just hope that it encourages you to see that that black people have been following jesus and submitting to the rule of the holy spirit in their own unique distinct ways even longer than europeans have <laughs> What's up, everybody? This is Lisa Fields, founder and president of the Jew Through Project, and this is six highlights from the Jew Through Project for 2022. Number six, the unspoken documentary in partnership with DLC Media. Number five, the Juneteenth documentary in partnership with Our Daily Bread. Number four, our Right Now Media series Through Eyes of Color. Number three, our Courageous Conversations curriculum. Number two, our Courageous Conversations Conference 2022. And number one, Problematic Passages featuring Dr. Esau McCauley and Dr. Joe Vitale. We've had an incredible year. I mean, God has done some amazing things that have caused growth and we have reached millions across the globe with your help. Help us continue the mission and the vision of the Jew3 Project at Jew3Project.org. We need your help to help people reimagine faith through apologetics. Every gift helps equip and help us to expand in 2023. Grace and peace. Well, thank you for watching another episode of the Jew3 Project podcast. As always, I'm your host, Lisa Fields, the founder of the Jew3 Project. And today I'm joined by uh, no stranger to the Jew3 Project. He's uh, as I called Esau last week uh, or the week before last, he's like a theologian in residence here at the G3 Project. We could not do or reach the people we've reached without Dr. Vince Bantu's voice. I'm so thankful for him and the ways that he's contributed to the work of G3. Um, it's been a pillar to, to our ministry. So uh, welcome, Vince. It's good to have you back. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Lisa. Always good to be here. Yeah. <laughs> For people who haven't seen you before, I don't know if you haven't, how you haven't seen Vince on the podcast or social media. Every time we post a, a video of him on, uh, especially Facebook, it almost always goes viral. Uh, so you could, you've, you've probably seen him on something. Uh, just tell our audience a little bit about who you are. Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. So again, it's great to be here. Uh, yeah, my name is Vince Bantu and I, uh, I have a few hats. Um, I, I teach church history and black church studies at Fuller Theological Seminary. And uh, and I also direct um, the Ohene or the, the president of the Meacham School of Hymenote, uh, which is a, a black biblical graduate level uh, seminary where we, through our partners, offer MDiv and Ph.D. degrees. And then also, uh, along with my wife, I actually co-pastor a small church here in St. Louis in the west side where we live called Beloved Community Church, uh, where I live with my wife, Diana, and our two daughters, uh, Taina and Aniki. Yes. Um, so we're excited to have you on today uh, to talk about something that I think is important. We've talked about uh, early African Christianity so many times on, on the podcast, and even before we get into that, Y'all, Dr. Bantu has his own podcast under the Jew 3 umbrella called The Bizrot. So if you haven't listened to that, we have to uh, get him uh, to do season two. But if you have not listened to season one, go back, subscribe, wherever you get your favorite podcast, or go to our YouTube channel to watch those because it is an amazing podcast and really does a deep dive in early, early African Christianity and get his, his book as well. Uh, but... Um, yeah. So as we talk about more about early African Christianity and we talk about Ethiopia, there's this thing like, well, I want to uh, untether myself from all whiteness. And so uh, Ethiopia, I'm looking at that Bible and their Bible is different than ours. So should I trust the Ethiopian Bible? Have you heard that question, Vince? 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> definitely. So, so how should we? First of all, let's talk about the distinctions between the Ethiopian Bible and the Bible that we most commonly use in the U.S. The sixty-six books. Yeah, yeah. I, well, I think you know uh, at the outset, probably you know one of the biggest differences is just the number of books. Because, like you mentioned, in the and we can just like let's say we can call it the Protestant Bible, um, mm-hmm. and I'm defining the word Protestant as a categorically European and European descended movement. Um, Mm -hmm. that, you know, because actually, and we can get into this too, and we've gotten into this even, like you said, on the Visrot podcast and other things, but, um, but, you know, there actually was a reformation also in Ethiopia, actually, that was, that happened a century before the European Protestant Reformation. And so, um, and so I, you know, I think I always like to specify what reformation we're talking about. And so Mm -hmm. again, when you talk about Protestants, uh, that's, you know, more of a movement that started in Europe and has now spread all throughout um you know the the world especially through european colonialism and uh and slavery and so um and so yeah when the protestant reformation came about um and people have different you know ideas about you know why this is and also i mean i'm you know this kind of bleeds into my area a little bit but i do want to give a little disclaimer that i'm not technically a bible scholar like you mentioned dr esau that's the that's the bible dude and so but you know just uh, but it does intersect with church history of course because the bible uh, provides the foundation for the church especially in ethiopia and so again my understanding um is uh you know not as a bible specialist is that there was a lot of different there's a lot of different theories as to why people like martin luther and John Calvin in Europe when they were trying to break away from the, uh, you know, or really they were trying to reform the Catholic Church, honestly. And then some mm-hmm. of their followers really wanted to break away. Um, and certainly Calvin wanted to create his own society that they had a different canon. Uh, and so it should probably be first stated that the number of books that's different between the European Protestant and then the churches that have followed the European Protestant canon of the bible the 66 books the 39 in the old testament and the 27 in the new um that that actually even before we talk about the ethiopian bible it should also be pointed out that it's not only a difference between the ethiopian orthodox tewahedo church and the protestant bible but also a difference between the protestant bible and the catholic roman catholic bible as mm-hmm. well as other eastern orthodox because the ethiopian orthodox tuahedo church is uh, among the family of orthodox churches and even within mm-hmm. the family of orthodoxy you actually have two major branches of orthodoxy you have what's called eastern orthodoxy and that's basically your orthodox churches that are largely in eastern europe like greek and russian and uh, U- ukrainian uh, romanian uh, bulgarian all that kind of stuff albanian And then you have what's called Oriental Orthodox, and that's the churches that are from like Africa and the Middle East, like the Syrian Orthodox, the Indian Orthodox or the Malankara, uh, the um, uh, Ethiopian Orthodox, Eritrean, the Coptic Egyptian Church. All Mm -hmm. of those ones are called Oriental Orthodox, but all of them have uh, a different Bible. And and really, to keep it 100, through most of church history, um, there was a larger canon that most theologians considered to be canonical than what the European Protestant Bible removed from. And basically, there was a whole section of book. There is a whole section of books that's in the Catholic Bible and all the, you know, Orthodox Bibles, uh, or at least, you know, many of them, and including the Ethiopian Bible that are not in the Protestant Bible. And that mm-hmm. section of books has various names. Um, some of them are pejorative and some of them are, you know, what people actually call themselves. So you might have heard uh, one of my least favorite names is when people call these the lost books of the Bible. I'm like, they're not lost. <laughs> like people have been mm-hmm. reading them, you know, for for centuries and, and they've never been lost for a lot of people. Um and uh or some people say the hidden books they ain't been hidden either they they've been in uh, there's manuscripts and they've been copied and translated since the beginning of the church uh and actually even before the beginning of the church because they were actually jewish books um then some people will call them the apocryphal books and again this is really a pejorative term because the word apocrypha in greek means hidden and again it, it gives goes to this language of it being hidden they weren't hidden um mm-hmm. And then another term that will be used is these are pseudepigraphal books. Well, again, that's also a kind of an insulting term, especially if you're from these communities that believe in these books, because pseudepigrapha just means like a false author attribution. Like they don't, some people who don't accept these books, part of the reason they didn't accept them is because they didn't believe that the authors who they were attributed to actually wrote them. 
Um, mm. But the the name that most people will use uh, that we should probably use, even whether you accept these books as canonical or not, is the word Deuterocanon. And the word Deuterocanon, like Deuteronomy, means second law uh, because mm -hmm. it was the second time Moses uh, stated the Ten Commandments. Deuterocanon means like second canon. And it, it and and again, just to look at it from Catholic or Orthodox perspective, it doesn't mean second in the sense of like a you know a diminished status because they would consider the Deuterocanon to be equal in authority to the 39 books uh or actually really the 22 books if you want to go by the jewish hebrew the original tanakh right because like first second samuel first second king they weren't two books it was one book or ezra and nehemiah was one book and so uh, but anyway they would consider those deuterocanonical books on the same level and the deuterocanonical books basically cover the time of history between like the book of malachi and the book of matthew because we know that there's a 400 plus year gap between the time when the when God brought the Hebrews back from exile into Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, and that's like in the 400s, and then all of a sudden, next thing you know, we jump to the New Testament, and we're you know in the genealogy of Jesus, and we're at the time of the Herodian dynasty. So there's 400 year plus gap right there. The Deuterocanonical books, when you read them, talking about Tobit, Maccabees, uh, Bell and the Dragon, Wisdom of Solomon, Baruch, you know, all these, you know, there's a there's a handful of books that form the Deuterocanon, and they all are set during that Second Temple period. Period. And they really just fill in historical gaps. And and there's really no, I'm just speaking now as, as a pastor and a Christian, uh, there's there's nothing that is theologically problematic in these books. You know, there's nothing that teaches against the gospel or, you know, God, uh, the Yahweh of Israel. But they just really fill in gaps and talk about what the Israelites were dealing with after exile. But then, especially when they were being colonized by the Greeks and, and some of the revolts that happened, especially under the Maccabees and different uh, teachings and, and, and wisdom literature and also more ritual laws for purity. So it's theologically in line with the Old Testament. So then people say, well, then why did so many Protestants in Europe reject those books, especially when they had been used and considered the canon for a very long, I mean, from the very beginning of the church, some of the earliest theologians, you know, Tertullian, uh, Irenaeus, Justin Martyr, um, you know, uh, many of the early uh, theologians considered them as as Bible canon. And, and there's a lot of different reasons as to why people think that, you know, Luther and other reformers after him uh, saw them as not canon. But some of the reasons people think maybe that they did is one is to just to distinguish themselves from the Roman Catholic Church, because that's what they were trying to do, say we're a new movement and we're different. But another reason, and this is even why a lot of Protestants today will not consider them canonical, even though they're not like there's nothing problematic about them theologically, but they won't consider them as being the word of God in the same way that the 66 books are. Or the, let's talk about the Old Testament, the same way that the 39 books are. The main reason that a lot of Protestants do is because um, Jesus and the apostles do not quote from those books. Um, whereas they do quote from every, every one of the 39 books of the Old Testament is quoted in the New, and even Jesus himself, when he quotes it, refers to it as the Word of God. So if Jesus is God in the flesh, and he's referring to these books as the Word of God, then there's a sense of priority. Now, and we're on Jude 3 Project, so we got to address another elephant in the room. Um, in the book of Jude, there's a question, and this brings us to the Ethiopian Bible, because the Ethiopian Bible is even more unique because it actually has a few extra books, even more than the Catholic or other Orthodox traditions. So the Ethiopian Bible is, by book count, the largest book in all of Christianity. It has the largest can. It's got 81 books. And a couple of those books are actually unique to the Ethiopian church. They, they, they're only considered canonical. In addition to the 66 books of the Protestant Bible and in addition to the Deuterocanon that the Catholic and other Orthodox churches have, they got a few more books. And the most famous of those is the Book of Jubilees and the Book of Enoch. And, uh, and about, we can, I mean, I'm sure we'll get into that more, but just real quick, I would say that the, the whole, like, does the New Testament quote from these books or not, there's actually a question about, actually, the, some people think that in the book of Jude, it later makes a reference in verses 14 and 15 uh, to Enoch. And, and then what it goes on to say, many people consider to be actually a direct quote from the book of Enoch. And so that's where in some of the argument over the centuries, people have said, well, actually, if you're going to use that criteria that it quotes from the old, then some people have said Enoch uh, can actually count as canonical because Jude, which is New Testament canon, 
and even that was you know controversial to people like Martin Luther but most people consider Jude to be canonical and if it quotes from Enoch then it might be also but then other people have pushed back and said well actually Jude may and Enoch itself may have been quoting from Deuteronomy 33 and so it's really a quote of a quote so it's, it's very uh you know but for the most part the New Testament doesn't quote from those books and that's why people and also the other reason is that um the Jews in the first century did not consider those books canonical, but only the 39 books. And even part of the reason for that has some people have said is because they did not survive and, and maybe were not even originally written in the Hebrew language, uh, but they were written in Greek as part of the, you know, uh, Hellenistic Jewish literature. And so, um, so yeah, but you know, that's the, so anyway, I'm sorry, that was a long answer, but that's like the main difference is, is that it has a lot of different it has different books than even other churches and it even has some that are unique only to the ethiopian orthodox church and even though and the last thing i'll say is that even though like i said there's nothing theologically in these books uh whether it's the broader catholic orthodox deuterocanonical books or the special uniquely only canonical to the ethiopian orthodox church books there's nothing theologically contradictory to the overall teachings of christianity but there are some things, especially in the book of Enoch, that are theologically interesting uh, and that raise some questions. And has that's also what's made people kind of back away from it a little bit. It's nothing like heretical, but it's just like it talks a lot about angels and, and demons and, and mixing with humans and all kind of stuff that, that people have uh, just kind of wondered. And that's unique to that book. That could be true, but also it's not you know confirmed in any of the other books that's another reason why there is a little bit of a different theology um and in in some of those books as well yeah so talk talk uh, that was extremely helpful talk a little bit about the unique books to talk a little bit more about the unique books as it relates to the ethiopian bible and you talked about that there was no really theological problem with them could you lean more into how they started to adopt these books outside of the ones that uh, more Catholic uh, or the more other churches had adopted? How did they come to adopt the books that they adopted versus the other churches? Yeah, yeah, that's 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 a great question. Um, and so, yeah, you know, so um, the, the the book of Jubilees is um, actually there 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 are a few books that are unique to the Ethiopian Church. Again, even more so. Again, if there's readers out here that have not even familiarized yourself with the Deutero Canon, the larger Deutero Canon, or that's more largely accepted, uh, I would definitely encourage you to go read those and get get hip to the book of Tobit, uh, you know, book of first, second, third Maccabees to, you know, Psalm 151, uh, additional chapters to Daniel and Esther, all these different readings that are in the Catholic church and in the, uh, Orthodox churches. Definitely. Uh, again, they mainly focus on history, um, and theology and religious practice between the old and new Testament time periods. Um, so definitely get hip to those, but yeah, like, um, with the unique books that are, that are on top of even those in the Ethiopian church, uh, there's first of all, there's actually another uh, set of first, second, third Maccabees that cover similar themes as the broader ones that were in Greek, but they're actually unique and the content is different. But it covers much of the similar themes of the Maccabean revolt against the Greeks in the uh, intertestamental time period. But like I said, the most famous ones are the ones that have drawn the most scholarship is the book of jubilees and the book of enoch the book of jubilees is actually and this is part of the reason why some people have uh, not seen it as uh, as canonical is because it actually covers jubilees co is in many ways seen as like a midrash to the book of genesis it, it really presents um it's it's very liturgical uh, or ritual type of book like kind of like leviticus that or exodus talking about more information about the festivals and the and the jubilee festivals of the hebrews and in conversation with or in reflection to genesis so that's one reason why some people have not seen it as canonical because they've seen it as midrash or commentary on the bible rather rather than the bible itself um, but again, theologically, there's nothing that's very different about Jubilees, but with Enoch, that's where a lot of the attention has been drawn because again, there's a whole lot of very interesting information, uh, and theology in the book of Enoch. First of all, it deals with a lot of cosmology, uh, that really picks up on two verses that are in the Bible, but we don't get a lot of information. Number one on who is Enoch and the book of Enoch is claimed to be written by Enoch, like the, the, the great granddaddy of Noah, like 
you know, straight up Enoch from the Bible. And the book, the Bible says Enoch walked with God and God took him. Well, in the mm -hmm. book of Enoch, they go in on that <laughs> and where God took him and that he, they took him up to heaven and, and he, you know, saw the angels and he got a visions of all kinds of things. And, and also we see later in Genesis that we see a mention uh, right before the flood of these, this group called the Nephilim. And even later in the Old Testament, we see mentions the uh, Israelites are spying out the land. And they talk about giants in the land. So we see these references to these beings, these these uh, Nephilim that 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 uh, unite with women of earth and then give birth to these giants. And there's but again, it's we don't get much information about this from the Bible, but we see that clearly the book of Enoch didn't completely just make this stuff up, but it provides information that if, you know, again, it depends on like, if you take this to be the word of God, or if you take this to be factual. Um, and so, but it, it, again, it gives all kinds of, uh, background about the origin of angels, the origin of demons and the origin of the Nephilim and, and where they came from. And even the, and it gives all kinds of names of specific angels and specific demons and their roles and what they, uh, the ways they torment people or the way they bless people. And it just gives lots of specific information, much of which is not in any other book of the Bible. Then the other major focus of the book of Enoch is being apocalyptic, uh, much like the book of Daniel or much like revelation that it has lots of prophecies uh, about the end times. In fact, there are many prophecies about the son of man, which is a title that appears in Daniel, but it's, also picked up in Enoch and it is largely developed the prophecy of the son of man, this messianic figure. And it's so much to the point that even more than other Jewish literature, um, it, it like a lot of Christians have, have even believed it to be strong references to Jesus. In fact, so much to the point that some people have even argued that the book of Enoch was written during the Christian time period, like in the second or third century by a Jewish Christian who strongly wanted to show that the prophecies referred to Jesus. And, but also most scholars would say that the book of Enoch, like Jubilees and like all these other deuterocanonical books were written by, um, by Jewish people. And, and that, it continue but also expand on uh jewish traditions of ritual and also apocalypse and and prophecy so most scholars would say that jubilees and enoch were originally written in aramaic so these would have been jewish books that would have come from israel uh, or from palestine not from ethiopia but they only survive in the Ethiopian ancient language, which is called geiz geiz is the oldest language in ethiopia and these books only survive in, in Ethiopia, and, and so that's a major reason why a lot of people think that uh, that these are only accepted as canonical in the Ethiopian church, because they've had them for the longest, and they clearly had a very strong influence on Ethiopian Christianity. We know that Ethiopian Christianity, more than any other version of Christianity, is very Jewish in its uh, style and its ritual, um, in its, uh, they, they very much are about honoring the Sabbath. And, and there's also, there's always been a strong Jewish presence in every Jew Ethiopian Orthodox church. There's a, a Makdas or a, a, a Holy of Holies and behind the altar of the, of the priest. And it's like a temple. And so there's all this kind of Jewish, uh, um, uh, flavor, if you will. And so it makes sense that these books would have survived, but there are references to them and fragments of them in some of the Dead Sea Scrolls. So we know that they were likely not originally written in Giz, um, and there are fragments of them that survive even from the Dead Sea Scrolls in Qumran. So these books were in Aramaic probably even before the Christian period, first century BCE, uh, but um, but they only survive in Giz, and, and that's probably a large reason why they're not as well known. Um, but, the, but also to the other point is that actually shows us um, that, you know, at the end of the day, it's actually like Protestants who have walked away from the original canon, if anything. So if we think about why did the Ethiopian church adopt these books when other people didn't, I would actually say we should re reverse that question a little bit and say, why do Protestants not accept them when Protestants came much later? Martin Luther, you know, that's not till the 1500s. And the Ethiopians were already, these had already been considered canonical. Book of Enoch, Book of Jubilees, these are mentioned by early Christian theologians. They're mentioned by Tertullian. They're mentioned by Origen. They're mentioned and seen as canonical. So then some people say, why did even the Catholic Church walk away from those particular books? And nobody, you know, I, I mean, I think people have different opinions. I don't know if anybody really knows, but all we do know is that sometime in the 300s, which is around the time that Christianity started becoming the dominant religion in the Roman Empire, and you had Council of Nicaea and all that kind of stuff, sometime after that, the these books just started becoming less 
commonplace or less known in the Roman Empire, whereas the other Deuterocanonical books still were considered canonical, but Jubilees and Enoch were mainly still only being uh, practiced in the in Ethiopia. Uh, and so, you know, and of course, according to the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, Enoch wrote the book thousands of years ago, and Ethiopia itself was a Jewish nation going all the way back to the time of the Queen of Sheba. Now, some people doubt that and think, well, no, Ethiopia didn't become Christian um, or even monotheistic until the 300s. And so even if that's the case, we definitely know that the Bible, including all of these books, came into Ethiopia and was there in the 300s. And, and some people say that it was from Jewish people, Jewish Christians who traveled Ethiopia uh, even earlier in the 300s. And then other people say that it was actually done by this group from Syria called the Nine Saints. And there was nine monks who came from Syria to Ethiopia. And uh, one tradition in Ethiopia says that they were the ones that translated the Bible from Hebrew and from Greek into the Ethiopian language. And some of the most some of the earliest books ever written in the Ethiopian language, uh, in fact, maybe the oldest book ever written was these these translations of the Bible into um, Geiz, and the most famous ones are the Garima Gospels. One of those nine saints, his name was Garima, and and there are manuscripts that you know some carbon dating tests say they go all the way back to the fifth century, and again, which would make them the oldest uh, books written in the in the Geiz language. And I just have to make a slight, short little caveat to just say how, especially for people of African descent, how amazing that is to know, because we have to stop and recognize for a fact, and we've said this before on different podcasts that the Ethiopian language Geiz, or and it's and the the alphabet. That that's still used today is the only sub-Saharan African writing system that's in use in the world. And the first book ever written in that writing system was the Bible, was the Word of God. And so that just shows how the Bible and the Word of God has been a part of Africa from day one, that these the Word of God was written in these African letters that are the only African letters that are in use today. And, and so, and, but all that to say that from the beginning, all of these books were considered canonical. So if anything, it was really Protestants that walked away from all these books. Uh, and again, for the reasons that, that I already talked about that they did. Uh, so, you know, um, yeah, but, but really it was the Ethiopian church uh, that, that stuck with books that were considered canonical from the beginning of the church. And then the Roman Catholic and other Orthodox churches, they walked, they're the ones that walked away from Enoch and from Jubilees, you know, for whatever reason, uh, you know, maybe they were doubted the authorship. It just wasn't as common anymore. Um, or they thought Jubilees wasn't canonical. It was Midrashic. Um, and then later than that, the European Protestants were the ones that they walked away from all the deuterocanonical books. So it's really more of like, why did they do that? Uh, because, but really the Ethiopians, they have uh, a Bible canon that has a much longer track record and has a, and has been used in the church much longer than the Protestant Bible that went out through colonialism and slavery and was imposed and most Christians around the world use today. Mm -hmm. Can you speak to the people that are listening and they're like, okay, well, now I got to go pick up the <laughs> Ethiopian Bible because uh, this, this information could be a lot and could be confusing for people who we're, we're in the midst of this series of can we trust the Bible? And um, this is a part of this series. And so for those who this seems to be confusing for um, about the trustworthiness of the 66 books and the distinction between the Ethiopian Bible, how would you help them kind of think through this in a way that they can have clarity and understanding and trust in the text? That's a great question. I would say that I would, I would say read, read the Deutero canon and read the Ethiopian canon, the Jubilees and Enoch, um, and, and learn more about the intertestamental period, learn more about the apocalyptic literature that came out of, you know, Jewish communities during the second temple period. And my encouragement, speaking as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, who holds the Bible to be the authoritative word of God, I would say to you that as you read them, and this has just been my experience, um, that as you read more and learn more, you will, I believe that you will actually learn to trust God's word even more. Because as I said, and I hope you caught what I said earlier, but I'm going to say it again, there is nothing in the Deuterocanon or in the Book of Jubilees or Enoch. It can say all kinds of stuff about angels and Nephilim and all that kind of stuff, but guess what? Nothing in these books contradicts 
the other 66 books of the Bible. And even more importantly than that, in my opinion, nothing in these 81 books or in these 79 books or these 66 book canons that these different churches have, none of them contradict the gospel of Jesus Christ, the bisrot, the good news of a Jewish savior who is God in the flesh, Emmanuel, who came down and was the perfect sacrifice and took our sin and died on the cross and rose again so that we could be made right with him and that by the seed of Abraham, every nation would be blessed. Every single one of these canons affirms that message. And that was the message, that was the litmus test. Because we could also talk about New Testament Apocrypha. Because that's where you actually have more of a problem. That's where I would say be more careful. Because when you get into the New Testament time period, well then you got all other kind of books. Like Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Thomas, Gospel of Judas, Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and all of these other so-called Gospels. But when you read those Gospels, you can see why the church everywhere, Ethiopia, Egypt, Europe, Asia, everybody rejected those books. And, e and again, remember, even even the people who accept or reject, even the people who reject the Deuterocanon, they're not, nobody is saying like, oh, those books are dangerous or they're against them or they contradict the Bible. They don't contradict the Bible. They don't contradict anything. So as you read them, your faith will actually grow stronger, I would say, because you see how the Bible, which is the most studied book in human history, is has a unified message. And even sometimes when there are, you know, uh, differences like, you know, factual differences or things like that, like, you know, one book says it was this amount of people, that book says it was that amount of people, that the differences are so minute um, and that could be, you know, it could have just been that these are the copies we have. So if anything, it trusts our, it, it builds our trust in the word of God to know that a book that's really not a book really if you think about it it's dozens of books that have been written by dozens of people over thousands of years and have been translated more than any other book in human history that even the differences in the copies we have today are so minute and so insignificant to the message of the Bible because that was the litmus test even to rule out a lot of these other writings in the New Testament because they it, it, they were being written at a later time and they were promoting theology that was clearly against the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. These other gospels that I was talking about, they are problematic because they were teaching from a worldview that was called Gnosticism, and they were teaching things like, well, the physical world is bad and the spiritual world is good. So therefore, Jesus could not have really been God. Uh, he was just a human who was very enlightened, and he had this gnosis, right? This Gnosticism, this gnosis, this knowledge that he came to give. And But he wasn't really God, though. Well, if Jesus wasn't God, which the Word of God says he was, how could he have died and rose again through his own spirit? And then other Gnostics were saying, like, no, he wasn't, he was God, but since flesh is such a terrible thing, God could never have been really human. So Jesus wasn't really human. He was just a ghost. He looked like a human. And so, but again, 1 John tells us that the Antichrist is the one, the spirit of Antichrist says the one denies Jesus came in the flesh. So Jesus was fully God and fully human. And so that's how you can already read the Gospel of Philip and all that and already know that this is teaching a message that is not from the gospel. The gospel message is the most important thing. And the gospel mm -hmm. message guides us. The Holy Spirit guides us as we read through these different books. The written word of God will be will confirm what is told to us through the spiritual, the living word of God. Because if you think, now again, hear me right. I believe in the Bible. I believe that the Bible is the word of God. Um, and, and, and I believe it is my rule and authority in life. But at the end of the day, you don't actually need the Bible to be saved. If you walk out right now and go talk to someone who's never read the Bible and you tell them the gospel and tell them about the Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ, who died and rose again for your sins, and the Holy Spirit draws them to faith and they give their faith in Christ, they're saved in that moment, even if they never cracked open a Bible. So don't get me wrong. We need the Bible. God, it's our rule and God gave us the Bible. But at the same time, uh, you can be saved without ever reading a Bible. The thief on the cross was saved and in fact, all the early Christians were saved. The Ethiopian eunuch was saved in Acts 8. And Acts hadn't even been written yet. <laughs> and, you know, the Gospels hadn't even been written yet. And yet people put their faith in Christ. How? Because they heard the Gospel. And just like Cornelius, the Spirit fell and they were saved. But then God gave us his written word that confirms his spiritual word. So when these other books started coming out that were contradicting the spiritual word, that's how people already knew. So when you read, even you can read these other ones. And if you have the 
Holy Spirit in you and you hear the message of the gospel and you believe on faith, the Spirit will guide you in understanding these books that are not uh, in agreement with the gospel. And at the same time, you will be able to, uh, you will be strengthened in your faith even with those because that is the reason why these few little other gospels were rejected by every Christian everywhere. Like I said, in Ethiopia, in India, in Europe, in Egypt, in North Africa, in Syria, in Arabia, everybody rejected those books. Why? Because they were contradicting the gospel message. And somebody will say, well, no, it was because Constantine and because the Roman Empire made them reject it and the powers came in and decided. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Because the even before there was any such thing as a dominant Christianity, some kind of like Christianity that was in wedded with Roman imperial power, that didn't come to the 300s. But you had 300 years of Christians being persecuted and they were not in power anywhere. Christians were not in power Anywhere they were, in the Persian Empire, India, Roman Empire, Nubia, everywhere they were, they were minorities and they were not in power. And yet, they were all in agreement everywhere that these books are good and those Gospel of Philip, Gospel of Thomas, all that were our lies. And there was no political, financial, social incentive for them to reject these other books. They did it because the Holy Spirit. And they followed John. And they followed people that, they followed Peter. They followed Paul. And they followed people that were discipled by them, like Polycarp and Ignatius and the Did and all these other books that are in line with biblical teaching. And so at the end of the day, uh, you know, sorry, that was a long answer, but at the end of the day, I would, I would just encourage y'all to say that read all of these books, but read the Deuterocanon as well and be encouraged by the fact that there is no church in Christendom, whether you're Catholic, whether you're Orthodox, whether you're Protestant, whatever. Or if you're like me and you just call yourself a Nasrawi, uh, uh, you know, that's the Ethiopian word for Christian. Um, there is no, take comfort in the fact that there is no body of Christianity today, um, I ain't talking about Mormonism, but I'm talking about Orthodox Christianity that embraces a book that teaches something contrary to the gospel. And just like in the early church, when all Christians were being persecuted, every Christian church today rejects books that taught against the gospel and they embrace everybody embraces books that are in line with and uh, help support the claims of the bible the historic and theological claims of the bible and so read them and be strengthened in your faith but also like i said be first of all be be born again <laughs> and that's mm -hmm. my strongest appeal is put your faith in jesus christ as lord and savior right now if you haven't done so we don't even need to get all these books. Put your faith in Jesus Christ right now because he's the only one who can save us from our sins. And when the Holy Spirit comes in and dwells in you, the Holy Spirit will guide you and will help you understand how many of these books uh, add up the full picture of history and also will help you understand books uh, that came later that were against the gospel message. And the last, very last thing I'll say, uh, I'm sorry, I'm black preacher. I got to close four or five times. But but <laughs> but the last thing I'll say is also be reading, reading your Bible and having these discussions in the context context of a biblical community i know i know everybody's spiritual i know everybody got their own relationship with god i ain't trying to take that away from you but be in a biblical godly church and be having these discussions not just by yourself in a silo or between you and youtube videos but in community with bible believing people yes i'm glad you you said that when i was going off to seminary one of my mentors uh bishop von mclaughlin said to me he was like because i was thinking about doing a, a distance learning program and he said, one of the reasons I want you to go residentially, uh, which is nothing wrong with distant learning, so hear me well when I say this, is I want you to be learning these ideas in community with other people. And so, the, the, because he was like, if you are alone wrestling with theological ideas, it's a high probability sometimes that you may come up into some heresy. But if you are in community with others, um, wrestling with ideas, then it's a it's a better chance that you will end where you're supposed to be because it's not just about your relationship god i've been saying this and i hope people get it it's not just your about your relationship with god god has rigged our life for community so there are some things we won't know about god unless we're in community with others some things we won't know about god's word unless we're in community with others and if you want to be get a fuller picture of god if you want to get a fuller picture of god's word you need community with others and that's one of the reasons that the church and being a part of a church is so vital. So you could grow in your relationship with God and your relationship with one another. With your relationship with one another. God is not just concerned about his relationship with you. He's concerned about your relationship with one another. And your relationship with God 
is only as strong as your relationship with other people. And so uh, that's something that you should you should uh, you should note. Um, and I know it's hard. I've been using this illustration. Um, I from I travel a lot, uh, but people who really know me know that flying used to terrify me so much so that <laughs> when I get on a plane, I have to put on some worship music just to get my mind right for takeoff. And but. One of the reasons that I don't like flying is because of turbulence. But I love pilots that tell me beforehand that there's going to be turbulence on the flight or that turbulence is coming so I can prepare myself for the turbulence that's ahead. And thankfully, God's ordained plane, Delta, their pilots always give me the heads up. Southwest, not so much. Uh, but it allows me to be prepared for the turbulence that's coming. And I think when we go into church spaces, we need to know that there's going to be turbulence in community. Um, but when we know there's turbulence ahead, it makes us better prepared for the flight of community, for lack of a better word. And so I'm, I'm telling you to be a part of a church community, but I'm also telling you that there's going to be turbulence. There's going to be some people that make you sick on your stomach. There's some people that's going to frustrate you. There's going to be some people that can hurt you. But the same place that you will be hurt is the place that God calls to heal you. And so just uh, take that for whatever it's worth. Um, Vince, would you like to say anything else about the distinctions between the Ethiopian Bible and the Protestant Bible? Um, you so eloquently lay out um, in this this episode to help us get a better understanding of under, of how we should be thinking about these books. And I also would like to add some of y'all like to to focus on the books that y'all haven't got exposed to, uh, the the uh, the books that he mentioned, but you haven't read the 66 books yet. So don't necessarily be trying to grab other books when you haven't read, <laughs> you haven't read the 66 books you have. Um, and then you like to argue about books, uh, other books, but you haven't even read the books that you have yet. So make sure you're just reading the whole counsel of God's word. Um, Vince, would you like to add anything? Oh, yeah, nothing much. I would just say um, yeah, I agree with everything you said. And, and actually, on that last point you said, I mean, even the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and the books of Enoch, the books of Jubilees, uh, all these Deuterocanonical books, those books tell you to read the other 66 books. So <laughs> if you want to read these lost books, they ain't lost. Again, they've been, theologians have been talking about them and commenting on them for centuries. But if you want to read them, they're going to tell you read the other books too <laughs> because they all go together as part of God's word. And again, I personally am like, I, I'm open to, you know, the body of Christ. If we believe in Jesus, we believe in the gospel, the bisrot, the the Trinity, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, uh, who died and rose again for our sins, that we're believers. So, you know, I'm, I, I personally encourage you, to, if you're part of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church or another Catholic Church, if you believe in Jesus and you uplift the Trinity and, and, and the, you know, the gospel message, then we brothers and sisters in Christ. So if you accept these deuterocanonical of these books as well i'm saying hey it's all good because i've read them and i know that there's nothing in them that contradict the gospel um but also if you are what what's called a protestant um and you do the you know only the six six books it, either one uh they both are all supporting the gospel message and so i would just encourage folks to um again be led by the holy spirit again give your life to jesus christ today be born again be a follower of jesus christ the only lord and savior father son and holy spirit and 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 read the 66 or the 79 or the 81 books through the holy spirit submit yourself to the word of god and and also i would just like to encourage people um you know, uh, I, I would maybe I would just say two things is number one, like you were saying, Lisa, to folks that are on the fringes and just like to poke, you know, again, maybe just ask questions, but not enter the whole thing. I would say I would say get into the whole word of God, because, again, any of these books are going to tell you. And in fact, even the whole Ethiopian church tradition tells you to embrace orthodoxy. They said hymenote retet, which means orthodox theology in Jesus Christ. And so, again, be be in church community and be in church authority and not just asking questions off by yourself and be, uh, you know, be be really, um, yeah, submitting yourself to that knowledge. But also, I, to, I want to talk to believers and I want especially people in the black community and black church, especially when we're talking about Ethiop Ethiopian Bible, how this ancient African nation um, has their own church tradition. And they're the first black African country to become a Christian nation. The only black country in human history that's never been colonized. And they have their own 
literally calendar, got their own language, got their own architecture, their own musical styles, and their own Bible canon that's unique to them. And again, that's not heretical. I'm not saying people need to convert to orthodoxy. I don't plan on doing that because I have, you know, certain theological differences. But uh, but it, whether folks are or not, one thing that inspires me, and I guess a parting word I'd like to leave with us, especially in this Black History Month, and as we're thinking about this unique canon, is that this can, whether you want to just straight up, because I know a lot of black folks that are converting to Ethiopian Orthodoxy, uh, or Eritrean Orthodoxy, or Coptic Orthodoxy, and I'm like, hey, good on you. I'm not doing that, because <laughs> um, like I said, I got some differences. I don't pray to dead people. I'm just saying. That's just me. I ain't trying to show no disrespect, but like I said, I still, you know, embrace them as my brother and sister Christ, and we all got differences, right, on secondary issues. Uh, you know, some people have women preachers, some people speak in tongues, some people don't, somebody baptize babies, some people, don't, you know what I'm saying? Like, we all got differences on secondary things. As long as we can agree on the gospel, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, then we can be cool, and we can be brothers and sisters, and we could disagree on the secondary things. So I ain't praying to dead people, but I'm good if some of my brothers and sisters Christ, y'all want to do that, uh, you know, I don't think that's a good idea, but hey, you know what? Um, you know, we, we brothers and sisters Christ because you believe in the Trinity, and but I'm saying whether or not you want to go all in and convert into this, um, you know, this this form of Christianity, which I can understand, uh, or if you want to be like me and just be a Nasrawi, just a follower of Jesus. I don't, you know, I think either way, especially, like, like I said, especially for people of African descent, this should encourage us and inspire us to see that, you know, this African nation has their own Bible canon. Like, we don't need to always parrot or mimic white forms of Christianity. We don't need, that should inspire us, you know, in whatever, in, 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 in any other direction we do feel led by the Holy Spirit to really make this thing our own. Jesus did not save us so that we could just act like somebody else, but he saved us so that we could be the redeemed version of ourselves that he made us to be. Not to think that someone else has made the image of God more than I am, but I am made the image of God and I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus so I can be me and I can be myself. And I think that especially those of, the, uh, those of us in the diaspora who did receive Protestantism and receive Protestant canon and Protestant practices that many times even us in the black church, we feel that you know, sometimes for our uh, out of our own self hatred, we will feel that we need to imitate uh, systems of church that have come out of the white circles, and we just have to, you know, just do a black version of a white thing. But this, you know, African Bible canon, even if you don't want to accept it, which I think it's honestly personally fine either way, um, uh, or convert to that, I just hope that it encourages you to see that that black people have been following Jesus and submitting to the rule of the Holy Spirit in their own unique, distinct ways, even longer than Europeans have. And so hopefully that can inspire us to continue to really decolonize and deconstruct ways we have imbibed Eurocentric forms of Christianity and reconstruct uh, and, and, um, and, and engage with our ancestry and with the whole council of the, of the Holy Spirit of God and also of, uh, with the whole global body of Christ. Yeah, I think that's a good place to end. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Bantu. Um, for those who want to know more, what books would you recommend that would be helpful in understanding um, the things we talked about today? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, one, one, one book that's been helpful for me, uh, like I said, because I'm not a Bible scholar, and this is actually a broad book just that I think could be helpful. I, I think I've mentioned it before on the podcast, and it's even on our reading list that we have on the Jew 3 project uh, on early African Christianity. But uh, Ephraim Isaac's book, uh, Ephraim Isaac is actually an Ethiopian Jewish um, scholar who, who actually, I believe he started African-American studies at Harvard University. Uh, and he wrote a book called The Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church. And it's actually just a broad introduction to all of Ethiopian Orthodoxy, like historically, liturgically, but it, all, it also has a whole chapter on the Bible in Ethiopia and how it developed. And so that could be a helpful resource. Uh, but then also there's actually a um, a PhD dissertation from the Hebrew University uh, in Jerusalem by a an Ethiopian scholar um, from uh, his name was I think Gebre Jesus Mikhail Gebre Jesus Mikhail and uh, and I don't remember the name of his dissertation but it was basically on the development and translation process of the Ethiopian Bible and so I would say those two would be some some good resources to get much better information than what I can give because those are, again those are uh, specialists in Ethiopian Bible. Yeah, that's super, super helpful. Um, you are now on Instagram, so I'm so happy. I've been that was of you. hounding you that was to get of you. on Instagram. <laughs> yes. You've been I've telling been, me. Every chance I get, I was like, Vince, you got to step your social game up. So I'm <laughs> excited 
that I saw you. I just logged on one day. I was like, oh, Vince, join Instagram finally. So <laughs> what's your handle on Instagram so people can follow you? See, see, this is why the Lord is still working on me because I Let actually me don't go even know. And find it. Let me go and find it for you. I ain't even did nothing with it yet. I'm so old, y'all. My daughters be joning on me. They be like, Daddy, you're so old. I think <laughs> so it's just been my team. No, it's at uh m-a-m-h-e-r underscore bantu so at m-a-m-h-e-r underscore bantu uh so that's his instagram follow him uh we got you at 69 followers now we got to get you up there uh to the thousands uh so i know and you're on twitter uh at Hustle Bantu or something like that. Yeah, Bantu Hustle. Yeah, Bantu Hustle. Uh, so follow him on that, and he's on Facebook at Vince Bantu. Uh, thank you, Vince, for joining us for another episode. Uh, remember, if you uh, to on the podcast on iTunes, rate, subscribe. You could get all our past episodes on iTunes or wherever you stream your favorite podcast, or you could watch the episodes on Facebook or YouTube at Ju Three Project. You remember all of our resources, our curriculum. Courageous Conversations, all the things merch is at g3project.org. Remember, you can become a partner, financial partner with us at g3project.org by hitting the donate tab. You can give online or by mail. As I always like to say, every gift helps equip. Remember, the Unspoken Documentary is on Amazon. The Unspoken Curriculum is at unspokenmovie.com. Dr. Bantu is in that as well. He's been doing some screenings and Q and A's with that, that I heard have been going exceptionally well. Um, uh, remember here at the G3 Project, we're helping you know what you believe and why you believe it. Until next time, grace and peace and God bless. What's up everyone, Lisa Fields here, and I'm so excited about our new curriculum, Courageous Conversations. You heard about our popular conference, Courageous Conversations, where we invite the leading pastors, thought leaders, and scholars from conservative and progressive backgrounds for conversations. But we not only want to have those conversations on stage at the conference, but we want you to have them in your everyday life. So we developed a curriculum for you to do just that. Courageous Conversations curriculum, the tools you need for the conversations and culture. You can get that today on Amazon or on our website at jew3project.org.